So it is Tuesday, September 12th. We are on the campus of Stanford University. Uh, my name is Paul Ortiz. I'm a professor of history and director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And we are here with Professor William Gould. Um, thank you so much, Professor Gould, for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. Delighted to, to do it. Thank you, sir. Um, and for the course of the interview, I'll refer to you as Professor Gould. Is that is that fine? W whatever. You know, I've been called all kinds of things. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, Professor Gould, we're here, of course, um, wanting to learn more about your ancestor, William Gould. And I wonder if you could take us back to kind of maybe, first of all, start by talking about your childhood, kind of growing up, where you grew up, um, and if you learned anything about him as, as a youth. Yes. Well, uh, I was born uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, uh, our family moved uh, uh, to uh, New Jersey in, uh, for, when I was four years old. Uh, and uh, all of uh, my family, on both my father and my mother's side, uh, was, uh, was located in Massachusetts. Um, uh, some of the uh, people on my father's grandmother's side were upstate New York. Uh, didn't know really anything about them. Uh, but we did, I did know a great deal about uh, my father's uh, uncles uh, and uh, one aunt who was, uh, who was uh, they were all living in Dedham, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, Dedham is immediately south of Boston, uh, became more famous subsequently for the Sacco Vanzetti uh, trial and uh, at the uh, courthouse there. Um, and uh, we, uh, we would come back from New Jersey. We would take uh, trips often in the summer to uh, Dedham. Uh, I think my parents really always intended to uh, return to Massachusetts. They, they, they loved uh, Massachusetts, and my father in particular uh, uh, saw himself uh, returning, but we, we never did. But we came back every summer and visited with my great uncles and my great aunts, uh, one great aunt, who um, were residing in Dedham. We, we stayed with them just about every every summer, um, these uh, uh, people were uh, all, I, and I knew this at the time, veterans of World War One. Except for my grandfather, who had uh, died uh, before I was born, and who was a veteran of the Spanish-American War, and uh, uh, I had a lot of conversations with my. Uh, great uncles and uh, my great aunt uh, Dora Madora, whom I've subsequently learned uh, uh, corresponded with W. E. B. Du Bois, as did my father, and uh, uh, we. Uh, but we never talked about my great grandfather or my great grandmother. Uh, uh, amazingly, uh, I uh, even though the trips began when I was very young. I, I, they went on until I was, I suppose, uh, 12 or 13. Uh, I didn't have, I didn't uh, uh, inquire about this, and I don't recall them being discussed at all. Uh, my father and I, they of course were the people to interrogate about uh, William B. Gould. Uh, they, they knew him well, but um, uh, we never uh, uh, did this, although my mother told me in later years, subsequent to my father's death, that uh, my father had had conversations with one of uh, the great uncles, uh, 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 Lawrence, uh, about uh, William B. Gould's service in the Civil War. At that time, he, he had not discussed this uh, with me. Um, when Lawrence died, and he was one of the last to die in 1958, uh, he bequeathed all of his property to my father. And uh, my father drove up from New Jersey and uh, went to the house there on Milton Street in Dedham. And the workmen were already there, throwing things uh, out, uh, disposing of old things, some books. Uh, and my father went up into the attic, and he found this diary 
uh, a diary of uh, of uh, three three separate volumes, uh, uh, with uh, which commenced uh, in uh, uh, in the fall of 1862, uh, and uh, finished uh, his very last day of service uh, in uh, September 1865. Uh, when he was discharged uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. So my father uh, began to uh, discuss this diary. I brought the diary home, and I can see him now sitting in the living room reading this and said to me, this is something you should really read, and you should be aware of this. And uh, eventually I did. I don't know whether it was that summer or the... Well, the summer following, I was already in law school at that point, and uh, uh, there was a lot that I didn't understand uh, in the diary. It's a diary that's quite uh, readable, not only in the way he writes. He's a, uh, a very fluent, uh, gifted writer. He has, uh, uh, he, he has uh, so he's somebody who's not only literate, but he's uh, eloquent, a, a sort of God-given uh, uh, ability uh, to uh, speak uh, uh, very beautifully. And, uh, but he talked about a lot of things that uh, puzzled me about which I've been unaware. For instance, he, he, he talked about uh, North Carolina. Um, my, my mother told me, uh, had told me just around this time that uh, she thought, and my father had said to her, that my great-grandfather came from Wilmington, North Carolina. But again, this was never discussed. Uh, we didn't know anything about this. And I think, looking back on this, I think uh, uh, this is really uh, maybe in, uh, impliedly, or intuitively, like uh, the Europeans, people of European descent, didn't want to talk about the old country. And I think at this time, maybe uh, uh, there was the idea that slavery was behind us. And uh, we don't want to talk about that. And my father, of all people, would never say that. And I don't think he really subscribed to that. But, but, but somehow uh, he was downplayed. But once this diary, he found this diary, he began to talk to me about this. He said, you want to read this? I looked at parts of it. And I wondered, my great-grandfather's stopping in various places in North Carolina. Well, how, how could this be? I said to myself, because this is a Confederate state. How could a Union vessel, he joins the USS Cambridge. Uh, he says, all of us pledged allegiance to uh, the government of Uncle Samuel. He often calls our Uncle Sam, Uncle Samuel. And uh, he um, uh, says that uh, he uh, uh, pledged allegiance uh, that day to, uh, to the government. And uh, uh, and uh, he talks about stopping in North Carolina. He also uh, talks about various European ports that he stopped. His, his, his second ship, the Niagara, first was the USS Cambridge, stops out in, in Europe. And I'm wondering, what in the world is he doing in Europe? Uh, uh, in the, to this very day, uh, I think in the public schools, very little is known about the war that was conducted in Europe, except for the, the Alabama. People know about the Alabama. Uh, and William B. Gould's ship uh, was searching for the Alabama. And he, he says in his diary, uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, they run into an English pilot in the English Channel uh, in uh, the summer of uh, 1864, that uh, we now he have heard, the English pilot tells them that, that uh, uh, the uh, Alabama has been sunk at Kersage. And, uh, and he says, uh, too bad we didn't get a shot at her, but we're glad that but all the crew is, is glad that uh, she's out of the way. Subsequently, I discovered in 1911 that he wrote his recollections, his memoir, so to speak, largely based on, I think, on this diary. Um, and he says... In the, in the 1911 memoir, the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the war, um, that the crew, his crew, on the Cambridge, was almost, on the Niagara, was almost as proud as if they had done the deed themselves. And uh, so I, we, we looked at the, um, 
uh, we looked at the diary and my father and I uh, began to talk about it. And I think our idea was that uh, we would try to do something uh, together uh, on it. And uh, we, you know, there were, at that time, this is uh, uh, the late 50s and the, uh, then into the early 60s, uh, there was nobody alive from this period. But there were still people alive who had talked to the people from this period. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, just around this time, uh, my, the last of, the, uh, of these uncles, great uncles, dies. Uh, James Edward, uh, my uncle Ed, uh, dies in, um, uh, in Denham. So that's how, uh, it's through this diary that I really uh, became aware of him. And uh, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I uh, even though I was very close to the people who really knew him, uh, the great uncles and my, my aunt uh, Medora, who I can recall very well, who died in uh, 1944. Um, uh, she was an extraordinary woman. She was uh, uh, very literate, she didn't work. And uh, she lived at home and apparently did, you know, the, what women were expected to do, do the housework. And, uh, and most of the uncles um, uh, were, uh, were, some of them were bachelors. Um, uh, some of them uh, married late in life. Uh, there are no descendants uh, from, uh, uh, there are no children from any of those uh, marriages. Uh, uh, and uh, the only descendants in the Gould family come from uh, William B. Gould Jr. and uh, and uh, uh, and then of course my 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 father William B. Gould the third. I always um, I always uh, you know one thing I, I should just mention uh, uh, that that leads into William B. Gould is that my father had a great love for the uh, Episcopal Church. Uh, he was an Episcopalian. I was raised as an Episcopalian, even though I don't go to church uh, very often these uh, uh, days. I feel, uh, I'm writing a memoir now myself, I, I feel, and I say in the memoir, I feel as though the Episcopal Church, its liturgy, its ceremony, and uh, its language are in my bones. And uh, he was part of the Church of the Good Shepherd. I subsequently discovered that uh, William B. Gould was one of the founders, apparently, of the Church of the Good Shepherd, the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Dedham. And I, one of the things I found, I looked at the parish records, and I found that when, my, when I was born and baptized at the Good Shepherd, I was the fourth one to be baptized at the Good Shepherd. I think my great-grandfather uh, was uh, I think both baptized and perhaps confirmed at the Good Shepherd, my father wrote in the book, fourth in the direct line. <laughs> wow. I always loved that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Professor Gould, you're, you were talking about your elders earlier, and you were saying that you, that you didn't recall them talking a lot about slavery no. when you were a young boy. Do you... Um, how do you account for that? You said that they may have wanted to kind of move on or... Well, I, I don't really, I don't really, I, that's what I've, I, I have to assume that there was uh, some idea of uh, moving on. I think, you know, that was a view. It was a very common view at that time, I think, that uh, just as, as it was the case with the Europeans, who, you know, they... They came from impoverished, relatively impoverished conditions, and many of them from uh, different parts of Europe. They didn't want to look back at that. And uh, uh, I think there was, although I never heard this articulated in my own family, a sense of shame uh, about, uh, about this. How could this happen to us? How could we be uh, enslaved? Uh, that there was nothing uh, good in this uh, uh, story, nothing that could be derived from it. Now, uh, of course, when I discovered, and by the way, I didn't know for some years down, uh, down the road whether William B. Gould was free or slave. You know that uh, uh, there were a number of uh, 
uh, free blacks in the uh, uh, in the South, and and uh, uh, indeed, I don't want to get too far ahead of the story. John Hope Franklin, who, with whom I became, well, I, I knew him. My great aunt in Washington married to Ernest, one of the World War One people. Uh, my great aunt uh, knew John Hope Franklin, and and. Uh, when I was a student at the London School of Economics in the early 60s, he came over there to give a lecture and I went up and introduced myself. And, and then we, we connected, uh, uh, he, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the 80s, I probably through my initiative, probably through William B. Gould, and he wrote a memorandum for me about William B. Gould based on the diary. And he didn't think that William B. Gould was uh, enslaved. And only when I came to Washington uh, a number of years later uh, did I discover that uh, uh, through a number, of, a number of factors that he was, in fact, uh, enslaved. Uh, the great question uh, is uh, how in the world did he learn to read and write as he did? Uh, and we don't really know uh, the, and I don't try to answer that in, the, in my book about him. Uh, we don't really know uh, how he did. Uh, there are some people, I'm not a calligraphist, but there are some people who say that uh, his, his writing, his handwriting, which is beautiful, much better than my students here at Stanford, you know, they, they, they have beautiful handwriting, that... Uh, uh, this was the kind of uh, handwriting that was taught by missionaries who had come out of the north uh, down, who were able to come to the south and teach blacks who were enslaved in some circumstances to read and write. And there was a cadre of people, um, his friends, uh, all of whom, uh, uh, many of whom became prominent people in Reconstruction government. Uh, that he's corresponding with uh, and, and uh, talking about them in the, in the diary. Uh, they're obviously uh, literate as well. I don't know uh, uh, many of them. We, we, Abraham, Abraham Galloway, Galloway. Galloway is yeah. a, you know, mm -hmm. a classic example. And he met with Abraham Galloway in New York just after Gallo Galloway had met uh, with the President Lincoln. And, uh, uh, the, the two of them discussed uh, what North Carolina should look like uh, by way of uh, suffrage after the war. And uh, uh, Galloway had had that discussion with the president. Um, uh, there were uh, uh, many, uh, well, my, my, uh, his, his nephew, uh, um, Oh, I'm doing a, drawing a blank on him now. Who became the first black uh, lawyer in North Carolina? Um, uh, George Mabson, uh, and uh, he's corresponding with him. And of course, all these people become part of uh, part of government in the post-war uh, uh, the post-war period. Um, I, I should just mention one thing. Uh, in particular, I don't want to get you in difficulty back in Florida when I uh, say this. I always uh, uh, think of uh, when I was a child, uh, although we weren't discussing my great-grandfather, Reconstruction was presented in the public schools in a very different way. And it was uh, the traditional way, the Claude Bowers uh, way. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and the idea was that Reconstruction was... Uh, uh, something that was uh, dominated by, uh, 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 you know, scalawags, as they were called, and uh, cor corrupt uh, whites who had come down uh, uh, and uh, sought to profit uh, by this corrupt blacks. And uh, I always remember my father would come to see my lesson that I would bring home from school, and he'd say, no, this is not true, and, uh, and you no, know, this, is, this is inaccurate. And <laughs> I think because it, it wasn't until the revisionists came along in the yeah. 1960s that uh, uh, the, my father's instructions to me, uh, his advice to me, uh, be, began to uh, really find acceptance in uh, uh, 
in history. You quote Kenneth Stamp, of course, and he had one of the, the important works in the early 60s revising Reconstruction. And then you mentioned your father corresponded with Dr. Du Bois. Black Reconstruction is, makes a huge comeback yeah. in the 60s, magisterial text. All my students have to read it. Yes. Armin can tell you he, and by the way, Armin is also a graduate at London School of Economics. Oh, I'm not a graduate. I just went there for a year to uh, study under a professor that I had admired from afar. Nice. So I had a great, great year there. I, I was a so-called research student. I wonder, Professor Gould, and this, and this may be taking things a bit further afield, but when you mention Reconstruction, you know, Claude Bowers, but then your father is telling you, well, no, that's not really how it happened. You know, maybe it, it isn't until we can get a more accurate read on Reconstruction that it's, it becomes okay to go back and talk about slavery. Um, because Reconstruction is, as you mentioned, is, it, I mean, we in Florida, unfortunately, like my freshmen that come in, I can't really claim that they have a much better view or understanding of Reconstruction. Either it's not taught or it's just taught very poorly, but it's never taught the way Dr. Du Bois talked about in Black Reconstruction or that your great-great-grandfather basically, I mean, what I love about the diary and the way you frame it is how you situate William B. Gould as that generation who makes the war a war for freedom. But yes. it didn't start that way. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny, talk, as you were talking about uh, Harry Tubman, I was thinking of uh, the one thing I always said in one of my first speeches in Wilmington in 2003. I said that, uh, you know, th th that... Uh, uh, of course, the Underground Railroad was very, it was terribly important, but uh, this, this was an Underground Railroad. This was a, a railroad because th these people were carrying weapons that were, well, they were going to fight for uh, the United States. And you have this, uh, what I call in the book, the, the silent black exodus from the Confederate States. And you have a very substantial number of the blacks who are in the United States Navy uh, uh, coming coming out of these Confederate states uh, of value, of course, to the United States uh, uh, because uh, they were good intelligence uh, and, and knew where, where things were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and of course, of also because uh, the United States Navy, uh, uh, without conscription, uh, needed uh, people. And, uh, you know, they, when William B. Gould joins the United States Navy in the fall of 62, uh, it's just the period when things are going to uh, change. I, I went back, one of the things I did uh, as part of this book is I, I went back to uh, all the diplomatic correspondence, the correspondence between his commanders and the Secretary of Navy and the Navy Department to see what they were saying about what he was writing about. And... Uh, uh, I said to a friend of mine, I said, he, he got it right. He said, no, they got it right. He knew. He was, he was there. He wrote history as it was. He saw it. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, anyway, I, I thought that got me off what the yeah. point I was going to make earlier. <laughs> no, it's a great point because he knows, I mean, looking at the diary, it's clear that William B. Gould realizes he isn't just living history, he's making history. Yes. Yeah. And the people above him are really still kind of a step or two behind, right? I mean, you think about, I mean, I love how you talk about, because you juxtapose in your introduction Lincoln grappling, you know, with the preliminary emancipation. But his field commanders, Fremont, have already told him, Frederick Douglass has already told him. Every, people have said, you know, you can't f win the war with one hand tied behind your back. Yeah. Right. And Gould is, is, he's there on the ground, and he knows that. Yes, yes, yes. And he, he goes up to, uh, you know, he visits uh, Fort Monroe uh, 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 when his ship uh, heads north uh, and uh, visits one of his old uh, comrades, uh, who, one of the eight who escaped with him that night on the boat, uh, September uh, 21, 1862. He, he uh, who's gone up there and, 
uh, you know, the the uh, one of the so many unanswered, so many questions that were unanswered. Uh, some of which I've answered, some of which I haven't. And one of them was, how did he escape? And uh, um, I had, as you do, uh, these crackerjack research assistants uh, here at Stanford, and, and one of them, uh, a woman who uh, my wife uh, was able to get come to work for me, he, she said, uh, you know, she said, I, I see that he's always uh, corresponding, talking about the Anglo-African, this newspaper in New York City. And in fact, in his diary, when he goes to New York City, his ship heads north, the Cambridge heads north, he uh, uh, visits Robert Hamilton, the editor of the Anglo-African. And they're very close, and he's talking about raising money for the Anglo-African, getting people to contribute to it, reading articles. So well, why don't we have a look at that Anglo-African? What we find in that Anglo-African all these articles by this man under the, the uh, uh, nom de plume, Oli. And Oli is writing about in language very similar to William B. Gould's diary, writing about the very things that William B. Gould is writing about. And so uh, and then I went back to the, once we saw that, I went back to the muster rolls, and I found that William B. Gould was the only individual who was in all of these different places that Oli is writing about. So um, uh, it was not only a a similarity in uh, language, you know, like he talks in his diary about would-be King Jeff. We hope that uh, they found uh, Davis today, and we hope that they they hang him from the highest tree. You know, the uh, the the song that was so popular yeah. when, when we hunt, when we find Jeff Davis, we'll hang him from the old apple tree, and uh, and uh, he talks about that, and he uses that same language. Only he's using that same language. And clearly, Oli is uh, William B. Gould. But uh, Oli, uh, one of the fir Oli's first articles is an interesting and romantic narrative. And it's the narrative of his escape. Why is it a romantic narrative? And, and because it's a narrative describing uh, one of the, a woman who was engaged to be married to one of his comrades who when she discovers that the eight of them have boarded the Cambridge, she, also a slave, said, well, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go on the ship also. Of course, the idea of a woman uh, doing this was unheard of, but she, uh, for light skin, dressed as a, uh, was able to uh, find a Confederate uh, uniform Dressed as she was, she was, she escaped to a place and then was imprisoned and caught, talked her way out of prison and 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 uh, dressed as a Confederate, took the train to uh, uh, back towards uh, the Wilmington, the Wilmington Weldon train, and um, uh, she uh, encountered her masters who were coming to uh, coming to pick her up from the uh, jail. And, but they didn't recognize her because she was in this uh, uniform. And she gets on board this ship, this Cambridge. And uh, anyway, they, they, they uh, uh, marry and uh, they go to Virginia. And my great-grandfather, when the ship heads north, he goes and visits them there. They, they are living in Newport News. I, I went to, after this book was, I, don't know, I think after this book was published, I was invited to give a couple of talks down at Hampton and uh, had a good, tried to trace his comrade and to see if his comrade's descendants were still there. There are many avenues right, right. <laughs> involved in this. <laughs> well, when you mentioned Fort Wagner and William E. Gould F going, Fort Monroe. Go, Monroe. I'm sorry, Fort Monroe. Yeah. Going now, was he on garrison duty there? Had, had he been? No, no. He, he you see, what he, his his work um, he began in September, and they're patrolling principally North Carolina. They are looking at uh, uh, they're looking at, they're looking for uh, Confederate vessels and. Uh, uh, small uh, commercial ships, 
that are trying to get goods into North Carolina to send them north to replenish Lee's army in uh, uh, in Virginia. This is part of the this is part of uh, you know what Winfield Scott uh, called the anaconda, uh, an attempt to squeeze. Uh, the uh, southern states economically. So he's part of that in uh, this period of 1862, early 63. And then in 63, uh, because his ship is composed primarily of uh, whites who are from the north, uh, the, uh, the commander makes a decision to give them a, a respite. And uh, a, so his ship sails north, and they stop, and he's able to get to Fort Monroe because the ship stops there en route to cities like uh, New York yeah. and Boston. And, uh, and of course, it's in Boston that he reconnects with my great-grandmother, who has been purchased out of slavery in 1857. Uh, by a group of uh, uh, Americans, uh, white Americans, and, and British uh, society of friends, who um, who come together and and, uh, 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 and and purchase both her and her mother, and they go. They had gone to uh, uh, Nantucket, uh, which was a place that was considered to be a relative uh, refuge from the uh, slave catchers. Of that uh, of that time, and uh, uh, he. But so when he gets his ship comes up to Virginia, then to New York and to Boston during this respite. He then he then the the volume of correspondence that he notes in his diary with my great grandmother. Uh, she's of course the biggest recipient of his letters. Uh, uh, becomes much more frequent. Professor Gould, as best as you can remember, what kind of impact, like when your father first shares the diary with you in 1958, what kind of impact did it initially have? Well, it had a very major impact on me. And you have to, uh, 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 and I recall this quite vividly, because um, uh, I would characterize my life at that point as uh, in terms of accomplishments, uh, uh, very uh, uh, euphemistically uneven, uh, maybe in reality barren. Uh, that I was, uh, I had done some things uh, that uh, I'd begun to, uh, uh, at the age of uh, 19, uh, I'd read a, a number of books uh, that my father had. Uh, in particular, had recommended to me, but uh, it was only about uh, the age of 19 that I suddenly became a voracious uh, reader, and uh, um, I, I was a late bloomer, and uh, uh, I was beginning to wake up to things, and kind of, and I went to law school, and really wasn't very happy about law school. I didn't. Most of the courses were of no interest to me. Uh, I went to law school because of Brown against Board of Education. But most of law school at that time had nothing whatsoever to do with Brown against Board of Education or anything similar to it, very different from uh, the life that our students have here today at Stanford and other uh, uh, law schools. So I was kind of lost. And then I learned of this diary. And uh, this diary, I recall, when, uh, when I was about uh, 23, 24 in particular, this diary had, gave me uh, a great sense of uh, strength somehow, and, I, and, I, and this diary gave me uh, a, a much better appreciation. My father, I say in this book, my father was the greatest man that I ever knew, and, but, but I didn't know it at this point. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand him. Um, and then suddenly I began to see things that I hadn't seen before. And, uh, uh, reading this diary, getting a, a sense of what this man appreciated and what my father appreciated. And this gave me a, um, it gave me a great, um, uh, it gave me a sense of uh, strength and uh, self-confidence that I don't believe I possessed uh, uh, previously. And 
uh, of course, uh, to do anything in life, uh, you must be lucky. And uh, it happened that uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I was quite lucky. And, uh, uh, but, but it was a real turning point. You know, reading, seeing this diary, understanding, beginning to understand this man uh, was a great turning point in my life. And something that took me a long time to really uh, dig down into. You know, one of the uh, great regrets I have about the discussion going on today about reparations is that, uh, uh, particularly here in California, where the report has spoken in terms of uh, reparations for descendants of slavery, is that just for starters, it's very hard to go back, even in this age, I did this before the age of the internet, but uh, even in this age of the internet, it's very hard work. And uh, uh, so I began to dig into him uh, and his life and the circumstances of his life over, over a long period of time. But mm -hmm. at that time, late 50s, early 60s, this gave me a, a real wow. shot forward. That's amazing. Well, Professor Gold, you, in, in the diary, in the introduction, you talk about how you feel, or in my reading of it, um, you feel that you learned a lot about your father when you learned more about William B. Gould and maybe things you hadn't thought of before. Can you kind of maybe think or speculate even how, what types of values beliefs, things of that nature that William B. Gould tried to pass down to his son that you now can kind of see more clearly? Well, I think that he, um, you know, try to uh, pass down um, uh, many things. Um, uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was a man who overcame great adversity and uh, he, uh, uh, he never talked about it. He never, he never talked about it to me. Most of, much of what I learned about it um, is, is uh, much of what I learned about it is from, from my, things that my mother told me that my father had told, or the suffering that he, that he did. He was a very, Strong man, you know. Sometimes I would complain about things. He would say, "Be a man, be a man," you know. And um, that's the way he was. And uh, you know, when I was in Washington uh, doing this job at the NLRB, you know, oh my goodness, you know, all these horrible people, you know, trying to. But this is child's play. You know, this child's play compared to what these men went through. You know, to, uh, to, compared to William B. Gould, who, who dodged real bullets, and uh, William B. Gould III, who suffered from discrimination and who lived, who knew William B. Gould. Uh, they lived by one another, and uh, I think that um, you know my. You know, my my father had a a great he had he was you know he was he was such a Renaissance man. Uh, he he loved uh, so many things. Uh, he loved his family, but he he loved life. Um, but uh, he had uh, deep values. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, in my memoir I talk about. It how uh, at the time of uh, the Episcopal Mass, uh, there is a portion quoting uh, Jesus uh, saying, uh, come unto me all that travel and are heavy laden. Come unto me all that travel and are heavy laden. My father and I would always look at each other at that time at the Mass. My father loved those words, the comfortable words. Um, those who are rejected, those who are despised. And uh, when I became involved in handling uh, 
uh, you know, I sent you some material in cases that I handled racial discrimination. My father would call me and say, Bill, when are those guys going to get that money? When are, <laughs> when are those guys going to get that money? Because, you know, he, he said, you know, the worst thing we can do is to build people's hopes up and to uh, then leave them uh, flat. And he was, uh, uh, he, he uh, was a very wise man, very wise man. Um, as I say, you know, just, uh, and he, he believed in, in, the, in the little guy, you know. Uh, uh, I remember when I was in church, uh, all the choir boys in my church were for Dewey in 1944, and I said to my father, oh, I was sick home, I was sick a lot as a kid, and my father would come in and he would uh, do things to make me laugh, to make me forget how I was feeling. And he's very, very good at that. And he would, you know, he could come in and he would do a kind of dance. He was a very self-important, put on this very self-important face. And he was, turned out he was imitating one of my mother's suitors at the time that they first met each other. My mother would say, oh, Bill, she would laugh. <laughs> he would laugh. But he, I could see him now. And uh, I said to my father, uh, uh, the guys in the choir saying, vote for Dewey. Would you please vote for Dewey for me? Oh, yes. Okay, I will. So he came back from the ballot. I said, did you vote for Dewey? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he said to, to make me, uh, he said to, to pacify, you know, to, yeah. he was a very compassionate uh, man. And, uh, you know, uh, my father wasn't particularly, I became a baseball fanatic. Uh, I loved mm -hmm. I always loved baseball. I hoped to be a baseball player. And uh, my father didn't have any great interest in baseball at all. But, I, you know, I wrote a book about baseball, and I talk about the first game that we went to together. It was a doubleheader, and the second game went uh, something like uh, 15 innings. So we were there a long time. <laughs> but he was there because he loved me. Professor Gold, in your, you talked, um, you alluded earlier to your great great grandmother, and this her story um, is also a part of, of of this whole narrative. Could you talk about what you knew about her before you did this research? Like what you knew about her growing up? Not much. Nothing whatsoever. Nothing okay. whatsoever. Uh, as I say, you know, the thing uh, I say here that the thing we did. Uh, my father and I, uh, we would get into these tremendous arguments with my great uncles about contemporary politics. Because my great uncles, you know, they're all, my, my grandfather was a, uh, an official in the Republican Party at the, you know, the time of McKinley. And, and uh, they're all Republicans because the Republican Party was the party of freedom. You know, the, uh, and the Democrats were... Uh, uh, you know, the ones who wanted to uh, end the war on uh, the Confederate terms and then, you know, became part of the solid South that was so anti-black. Uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, you know, I talk about the fact when I was chairman of the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, uh, the reason we have state boards, or at least this state board, that to protect farm workers is the Southerners didn't want to have the labor law extend to farm workers because all the farm workers at that time were black. And um, uh, the, uh, so uh, we would get into these big arguments with my great uncles about, uh, uh, about the Republicans at that time in the 1950s, you know, and they, they would defend people like Taft and McCarthy and and my father and I were just beside ourselves, you know, we were arguing, but, you know, they, they kind of couldn't get out of this, this, uh, this uh, mold that uh, they uh, had placed themselves in uh, because of the, uh, the history, which was no longer present at that time. Uh, the attitude of the... So that's the kind of thing we, we talked about. And we, we, I don't recall 
You see, my, my great-grandmother had died uh, when my father was only four years old. He had no memory of my great, you know, you know he, t my father had told me some stories of my great-grandfather. I, I should revise a little bit of what I said before about this diary. The, the, my father told me some stories about my great-grandfather, two stories that I always stick in my mind. This was before the diary, before we discovered the diary. One was, I don't know what the context was or how he happened to say this, but he, see, there were three William B. Goulds living in two houses next to each other, and he got this call. The call came in, telephone, you know, telephones were fairly new at that time, and he, my father picked up the phone and he says, this rough, tough voice says, uh, Bill Gould? And my father said, speaking. The, the guy said, the hell it is. You know, you know, he's looking for my grand, for his, my great-grandfather. Uh, you know, there were three Bill Goulds there. My father always told me. Then the other thing my father told me about was that, uh, that uh, the reason the Gould name had become so important in Dedham was the work that my great-grandfather had done on the Roman Catholic Church as a, as a plasterer, as a mason. He was awarded the contract in the 1880s on St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Dedham, and which was, if you ever go to Dedham, I don't know if you've been there, uh, it's like it's a cathedral, like you can see it for miles. So it's a, really a, a, quite a structure. And um, my father told me uh, that uh, uh, my great-grandfather at that time had become a contractor employing other men. But the men on the job, at that time, you, you concrete, if it was left for a period of time, would degrade it and, and uh, it couldn't provide, couldn't fortify uh, a building as it was intended to do. I, I had a long conversation with... Uh, uh, tradesmen about this uh, uh, about this process uh, uh, because uh, the, the way in which you handle concrete has changed uh, over 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 the years. And my great grandfather discovered that some of his workmen had gone to sleep and allowed the concrete to set in a way which would uh, which could would not be discovered immediately, but um, uh, but. 30 or 40 years down the road, uh, you, you, may, you might begin to realize that you had problems with the building because the concrete didn't provide the, uh, uh, the strength that it was supposed to provide. And my great-grandfather had the whole wor all the work ripped out and uh, did it all over again at great cost to himself. He, he didn't, when he died, I. I looked at his, uh, he didn't have very much money at all, he, even though he was a tradesman. Um, uh, and uh, he had great cost to himself and did the work properly. And uh, the w people knew that this had been done. And my father said, from that day forward, the name Gould was very special in, in Dedham. If you were part of the Gould family, you were something it was something very special, and and uh, so those those two things I always remember uh, that he had told me about before we gotten into the, uh, the diary. The fact that this that this, but but nothing about my great grandmother. Uh, uh, only when I began to look at uh, some of the newspaper articles after my father had died, did I see that she had died in 1906 when he was only four years old. Well, it seems it, there's a, a symmetry there between the diary, or not the diary, but um, over the summer I gave a lecture on Frederick Douglass's first autobiography, you know, the narrative published in 1845, where he talks, where he doesn't really even mention Anna Douglas and doesn't really talk about her much at all, really, even though she played a key role in helping him gain his freedom. Of course, he didn't really talk about the Underground Railroad until much later in life because he was trying to you know, protect 
people. So I think that makes it much more difficult to kind of excavate some of this history. There could be, you know, it seems, I'm just guessing here, but there could have been secrets that people are, are holding um, or, and, or, or traumas too. Yes. Well, illustrative of that is, uh, you know, the fact that William B. Gould is always writing to his friends using their initials, not using their names. Who are these people? And another crackerjack research assistant who, who, who looked at some books that were just coming out just at the time we were doing this work. And that's how we found out who, except for Galloway, he mentions Galloway by name, but uh, uh, who, like Mabson, he, he talks, talks about his nephew. Who, who, how is she, how is he, uh, his nephew? And uh, uh, so, yeah, you know, because I think he feared that uh, if his ship was captured, uh, you know, these people would be fair game. And, and um, so you, you, di you didn't speak of uh, things, you, there are things you wouldn't speak of because of the fear of retaliation and the fear of, of death for the people involved. Mm -hmm. Professor Gould, so when, when, you, when you think back on the diary, I wonder if you could tell us, if you could think back to when you first started reading it and what was your state of mind and what was what were some of the early things that struck you about the diary i mean long before you started embarking on this serious research like remember as best as you can like those first read throughs yeah i w i would say the the thing that uh uh, uh struck me the thing that uh struck me most that I, I, I recollect most is uh, this, um, uh, this this deep commitment to uh, 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 this, this this struggle in in, uh, in the in the war you know uh, uh, this uh, this undated entry that he has about uh, uh, we we built their cities. We 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 fe, fe, produced the food for their children, um, uh, and uh, you know this is the this this system is the uh, is uh, uh, so evil. Um, uh, the, the kind of uh, passionate. Uh, Angry, controlled anger um, uh, uh, about this. The um, uh, you know, I say I think that that's uh, uh, one thing that struck me. There, there's so many things that he says that are uh, that are hints to uh, questions you have. You know, for instance, uh, what as I said, I didn't know whether he was slave or free, but. Uh, uh, I uh, then I began to look at this uh, diary and see that he his ship Cambridge had come in one point to a place called Rich Inlet, uh, very close to uh, you know obviously it's an inlet very close to the land. And he said I had a good look at the place that I came from, and it comes into Rich Inlet. So I went out to Rich Inlet and I went out and looked. At what he was looking at, and I could see it was this plantation that uh, his owner has identified. You know, I found this first. I found this. Uh, the people at the National Archives found for me, and I, I was able to use the uh, 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 the uh, log of uh, the Cambridge, which said, you know, it listed we eight contraband came on board. We we uh, here here are their names and here are their masters names, um, and uh, uh, the uh, so I I uh, you know I, I would say you know the, the, the passion that this man had uh, uh, about the war uh, uh, generally you know the 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 uh, the understated. 
See, the understated, sardonic tone, which put me in mind so much of my father. My father was a master of understatement. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, you know, when they captured the Georgia in the Bay of Biscay, you know, he, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, this is one good deed for uh, Uncle S for the crew, for Uncle Samuel, and we hope that uh, there will be more to, uh, to follow. Um, and uh, the uh, just the way he describes the capture itself, uh, how they how they apprehended the Georgia in the Bay of Biscay, and then of course this confrontation, this cat and mouse game with the the stone wall. Uh, the uh, uh, the ironclad uh, that his commander got in difficulty for for uh, not chasing the uh, stone wall uh, down you know they how they and they they tried to you know follow her into uh, into Lisbon Portugal and uh, they were fired upon by uh, the Portuguese who said that uh, they were uh, disobeying the Portuguese neutrality rules at that time. And, uh, you know, his, but as they're waiting for the stone wall out there, they're saying, he says, you know, who the victor will be, we don't know. But, you know, we, we want, to, we want to, to meet her. We want to fight her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, the sense of drama, uh, the sense of commitment, uh, these are the kinds of things that... Uh, uh, I, I think that struck me from the uh, uh, very, very beginning about him. Um, uh, and uh, also the sense of, uh, uh, the sense of uh, vulnerability. And uh, he, he, you know, when, his, when my great grandmother does not write to him, so, you know, he says, oh, C, he calls her C, Cornelia. Why do you not write? <laughs> and uh, the um, over, you know, and he, when he paraphrases uh, Richard the Third, said, "Oh, a kingdom for a male, M A I L, we have a kingdom for a male." Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. Donovan. I know you have have some questions. Sure. Um, Uh, this is Donovan Carter here. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about the ships, the Cambridge and the Niagara. Do you know whatever happened to the ships at all? Well, I, I don't know what happened to the uh, Cambridge, uh, as I recollect it. I, Niagara, I, I do know, uh, was eventually, I think, sold to Japan uh, after the war. And uh, the, but then came back. I think she actually the Niagara. There's a big article written uh, in the Boston Globe while I was doing this work. I don't, or, or shortly after I was doing this work. I, I and uh, uh, saying the Niagara had sunk in in the, the in the Bay of in Boston Bay. Um, uh, ultimately, but. Uh, I have I've seen pictures of the Niagara when she uh, docked in uh, Boston. You know, I, I went to uh, I went to the house, uh, the structure, the building where he received his discharge papers when he came in uh, on the Niagara uh, on the, uh, in September of 1865, and uh, he talks about the fact that he received. Uh, his pay, four dollars and something. He said, glad I am to receive it. So ends my service to the Navy of the United States of America. And, and um, uh, but, but uh, I think the, and then, as I say, she, she was sold to Japan, given a different name, but I think ultimately w went down in the, in the, uh, off, some people have tried to look into this. Uh, uh, there was a big article in the Globe, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. Wow. 
Um, I also want to ask about a couple, two more questions. I want to ask about the, you mentioned the Church of the Good Shepherd, um, and you talk about how you were baptized there, and four of the, four William Goulds have been baptized there, which I think is amazing. Um, can you describe, I guess, how it feels to be a part of, to be such a, a key, to be in the line of a, a key part in that community? What does it feel like to, to, uh, I guess, be a part of that? Well, I think, it, you know, it, it's, it is a source of, uh, it's a source of uh, pride uh, to me. Uh, it's a source of uh, uh, strength to me. Uh, the story that my father told me about uh, my great-grandfather's hand handling of this church and the way they were regarded in the community. But, you know, um, uh, I have to say, you know, that we each have to live on our own uh, uh, merits and accomplishments. And, and uh, you know, in, in this, you know, I remember that, you know, my, my father was, uh, you know, my father, he could deal with all kinds of people, not only different races, different backgrounds, old, young, and you know, he had these friends, my father, I never heard him, he wasn't a straight-laced guy or a goody-goody kind of guy, he, but I never heard him say a swear word in my life. And, but he had these friends, you know, every other word was this F thing, this F, you know. And he'd bring these guys back, and my mother was horrified, you know. These, these guys, he had all kinds of them. And I remember my father telling, telling me about his early days in Worcester, Massachusetts, when he worked uh, for a radio station after he'd gone to Worcester Polytechnic Institute there. And he said at one point, he said, you know, those days, everybody said, where does Bill want to go? What does Bill want to do, you know? Now, I say in my memoir, I said, you know, there, was a, there have been times in my life where I felt as though, oh, everything has been so beautiful. And, and, uh, you know, I had so many friendships and great time. I think my time in Detroit when I started my first labor law job with the United Auto Workers um, was a period for me that was just perfect. Mm -hmm. But I said it'll never be like my, what my father experienced. Uh, you know, it'll never, I'll never be that popular. And... Uh, uh, similarly, of course, uh, when I look at uh, what my great-grandfather uh, did, uh, I, I feel as though it, uh, it, it gave me sustenance and strength, but I know that uh, I can never live up to uh, uh, that standard, that very unusual uh, standard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more question for me. So, <clears throat> you've talked about you know, how much your father means to you. And uh, Paul here asked about kind of the translation of the values of, of William Beagle the first throughout your family. Um, you know, after reading his diary and learning much about him, if you could, let's say, speak with William Beagle the first, what would you ask him? What would you want to know? What would you talk about? Well, of course, I, 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 I would like to know, um, you know, uh, you know, when I first went to Wilmington, um, uh, I, the night before I went to Wilmington in 1989, I stayed at John Hope Franklin's house and we had breakfast that morning. And he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, uh, he said, I would like to go with you. He said, I'd like to walk the street with you as you look for him. And, uh, and that's what I did, you know, because I, I didn't know a soul in Wilmington in 1989. And I would like to know, you know, as I walked the streets, I wondered what were his thoughts as a young man? You know, the, here he was. Uh, this diary begins at 24. And, and you know, we've, we found the work that he did as a slave. 
uh, in Wilmington. You know, one, one of my first visits down there was to go to the, I went to the Bellamy Mansion, which is now, if you go to Wilmington now, you'll see uh, this uh, road marker uh, up about telling about William B. Gould's life up in front of uh, Bellamy Mansion. Who, I, I went to this beautiful, this beautiful antebellum mansion and admired the work. And then I got this call from the curator a couple of months later saying they had opened up the slave quarters and they had found the work. And on some of the plaster was WBG, you know, the initials WBG. Wow. And uh, so I'd like to ask him what, what, you know, what his life was as a, uh, what his thoughts were, what his experiences were as a young man, where we have no record. See, we have, you know, I was able to go to, uh, uh, I have his diary from 1862 onward, and, you know, and I, and I was able to go to a lot of things in that period. I was able to find out, I was able to look in the newspapers about him, his, you know, his, his work in, in the post-war period. Uh, when he became a leader in the uh, Dedham community in the Episcopal Church as a, as, a, as a contractor and as a leader, he became the commander of the Civil War Veterans Unit, the, the, um, uh, uh, the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. He became the commander in 1900, 1901. So we know something about him there. You know, we got some, we can see his movements, we can see the movements of the children um, from the uh, newspaper articles. In this period, we, this earlier period, we really have much less of a sense of the man. And I think I would like to, I would like to have a, uh, a sense of the uh, man. I mean, there's so much that uh, I would like to ask him questions about, so much that I would like to ask my own father questions about. You know, what I just found, a couple of months ago, I just found, or found a friend found at, at Worcester, correspondent letter between my father, correspondence between my father and W. E. B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. and and uh, and uh, I like to ask my father about that, you know, because my father, my father is writing to Du Bois, and he's talking about going to Ethiopia, Abyssinia, it was what it was called then. He had heard that. Uh, that uh, there were jobs available then for young blacks who were uh, in the 1920s. And, he, and Du Bois is involved, he, or my father thought that Du Bois was involved in this. And uh, so there's so many questions I would like to, you know, I'd like to sit down just as we're sitting down here and just have uh, days and days uh, to talk to him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Robert? Yeah, I got some. Yes, so this is uh, Robert Smalls here, and uh, I have a question about your great uncles. You mentioned how you and your dad would argue with your great uncles about the nature of the Republican Party back then and in the 1950s. Did y'all ever talk about the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt Taft split or the uh, Brownsville affair by that in no, that regard? No, uh, no, the. Uh I don't recall, I recall discussing the Roosevelt Taft split with my father directly, mm -hmm. but not, uh, not, with, uh, not with them. And uh, Brownsville, no. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I uh, the thing that I recall my father saying is that uh, you know, how rough uh, and terribly uh, uh, black uh, troops were treated uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, uh, in this period, uh, generally. But um, uh, not, no, not, not uh, that. My father was a, a great admirer of Teddy Roosevelt. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, although, of course, Roosevelt, we know, uh, uh, was a, White supremacist, but uh, but everyone was a white supremacist, <laughs> and and uh, but uh, but Roosevelt did things that nobody had done before, you know, uh, um, 
uh, and uh, had a, a better better policy positions than uh, uh, you know than the leading politicians had. But uh, no, I don't recall ever discussing that. You know, the thing that I recall about the conversations with my great uncles is mm -hmm. my, my father had. I, I, this is the abiding thing that always sticks in my mind. He, my father had great respect for these men, mm -hmm. great respect for these men. You know, my father, he, he the way he, uh, I can see him now, the way he uh, would, would treat uh, uh, my uncle Edward, James Edward, he had great respect for what they had done. And, you know, uh, elsewhere in many of my writings and speeches, I've talked about uh, uh, how my uh, father would sing to us uh, the songs of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. But the songs that he sang even more frequently were the songs of World War One, because those are the songs he heard mm -hmm. as a young man. And those are the, sons, the, the songs that were, you know, there's a long trail unwinding. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, left, right. I, I had a good job when I left. I left my wife and two fat babies. Left. Left. <laughs> I had a good job when I left. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's the kind of thing I remember him uh, 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 talking about. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much for that, because I was really in, when you said it, it piqued my interest. I'm like, oh, I love talking about that specific area of history. Yes, yeah. And back into that area of history, you mentioned how William Gould um, still had connections with, after leaving uh, Wilmington, he still wrote and had correspondence and connections with the Reconstruction um, politicians in Wilmington. Well, he, he had, I don't know how much uh, connection he had with the Reconstruction politicians once mm. they were Reconstruction politicians. Mm. He had connection with them during the war. Okay. These guys then become uh, uh, politicians. I know that uh, mm -hmm. uh, I found out, I was a little uncertain at the time that I wrote this book, but then uh, uh, well, this is a long story. I'll try to make it as brief as, as possible. Uh, when I was doing all, some of my work, I was in Howard, and um, they had a lot of papers, relevant papers, and and but somebody came along. Some librarian came along, picked them up. There, there were there were apparently things that other members of his crew had said, and they were lost. The Ole seems to have returned to North Carolina after the war. Mm. And uh, uh, there I was a little uncertain because I, you know, the idea of going back to North Carolina after the war, you know, this is a month or so after, after he's discharged, mm -hmm. uh, was something that was uncertain. But then um, my uh, oldest son, uh, online found uh, some of these materials that have been lost by the library, been misplaced by the librarian at Howard, mm -hmm. and uh, they confirmed that he uh, he did go back there. But uh, in going back there, if you look at his last uh, contribution to the Anglo-African, mm -hmm. he I don't think he speaks of any of any uh, uh, individuals now. Uh, I found that um, uh, some of Mabson, Mabson's descendants, remember George Mabson was his nephew, the first black lawyer in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I found them in the census living with him in Massachusetts, living with him and his wife in Massachusetts uh, long after the war. And apparently he took in uh, some people uh, with a view towards giving them uh, training in the trade. Mm. Of course, another very uninteresting, very, you know, in Florida, of course, your, your governor is saying that uh, uh, that uh, we should look at slavery, how slavery benefited uh, uh, blacks. Well, of course, mm -hmm. William B. Gould uh, did this work as a plasterer and mason in the South. He built, the, helped build the Bellamy Mansion, mm -hmm. but he, of course, uh, expresses this unmitigated hatred for the system, which uh, 
existed there, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, to say that this uh, that, that uh, there's any sense of uh, uh, of uh, gratitude is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, quite quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That that gave me a wealth of just re resource to look into and a different way to engage with that history. So I just want to say thank you for that. And sure, I got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is Armin Ferdis. Um, sorry, I was a bit late. And uh, if, if, I, if, if anything I ask is uh, repeating stuff, I apologize. Um, one thing that struck me is just the role of, or I'm curious about, is how um, masonry itself and the labor that was involved in your um, in your ancestor's life influenced your own career in labor activism I mean, how that may have shaped or if it didn't or if there was a specific kind of compassion for laboring for for work you know for people working and the vulnerability therein that you derive from that because um, it seems like I, I can tell that there is a, a kind of reoccurring theme there that you have a deep kind of compassion and concern for that and so I was curious if you could talk about that a yeah, bit. Yeah, I would say that uh, that it really emerged uh, prior to the time that I was aware of his uh, of his work. Uh, uh, it, it uh, you know, I've, I've uh, I, 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 the, I, I, I always stress what my father stressed to me as a child, and that is that it, it, the, the respect and dignity that must be given to people who work with their hands. He worked with his hands mm -hmm. and his mind. You know, he, he, in his diary, in the, uh, he's got these columns of mathematical, columns of, of mathematics and, you know, figuring out what, what, uh, what goes, uh, what goes where. He, he, when he gets his license, I think he has to take a test to uh, be a licensed uh, uh, plaster and mason. Um, so I, the thing that I was brought up with was the idea that uh, we we must respect the the people who uh, who make this you know vital contribution uh, through their hands as well as their minds. He was able to do both, but really I learned about that. Uh, after uh, I was thinking already of uh, things like the Brown against Board of Education and uh, the role that the CIO unions were playing in supporting equality. Uh, those things are, are what attracted me to, to labor law uh, and uh, my discovery of his work is more after the fact, related mm -hmm. but after the fact. And I mean, I have a few other questions, but I'll just ask one. And I'm curious about um, Pan-Africanism. I mean, you mentioned Ethiopia and Du Bois, and I was wondering if Garvey's name ever came up um, in in your if you or if you have any recollections of that. And um, just in general, in terms of kind of it, uh, in addition to that, were there com like kind of cross cultural solidarity as well with other oppressed groups? Was there anything? A distinctive around that that came up as well. Well, um, as a uh, uh, I, as a child, I I can recall. Um, of course, we always had uh, a great interest in South Africa, um, and uh, I, I recall as a, uh, when I was. Uh, when Milan came in, that uh, uh, you know, uh, here was someone just as Truman was desegregating the armed forces. Uh, you know, all these units that my great uncles and and even my uncles themselves fought in were all segregated uh, units, and just as Truman is breaking that up, uh, here you have the entry of Milan and uh, the beginning of what we now refer to as a, a apartheid and, uh, and this was discussed this was discussed quite uh, quite frequently in uh, in um, 
uh, in my uh, in my house, and uh, it's ironic that uh, then uh, subsequently, uh, uh, you know, I, I did so much work in South Africa that I well, I went to uh, been uh, you know I went there as a part of my memoir has a whole chapter on my work in South Africa and and uh, uh, the uh, met with uh, these uh, great some of them great leaders, some of them not so great, who, uh, who uh, uh, from 1977 onward. But, uh, and, and also, uh, I think we had, a, we had a politically, but I don't connect this with my uh, great-grandfather. I don't know what his uh, views with this would be. We had a sense of, uh, yes, that there was a common threat, uh, Kennedy's speech on uh, Algeria, the, uh, uh, the, that there was a, uh, uh, the, there was a, a common thread between uh, an international struggle and a, and a, uh, and a domestic one. But mm -hmm. I, you know, this business of uh, how you um, come to acquire the views that you do is a, uh, is a very difficult uh, is a is a very difficult one and um, uh, to to assess and I uh, I think um, as I look back on my life uh, uh, how I how uh, there may be a common thread that relates to colonialism as well as domestic inequity. Mm -hmm. Are these are these comfortable words that I alluded to earlier? Thank you very very much. I really appreciate you, Professor Gold. We kept you for quite a long time. I wanted to have a couple more questions though, and maybe ask you to talk about because we've been. I feel like we have this wonderful insight into the immediate impact of reading the diary, your, a sense of your family history. But I wonder if we could kind of zoom out because you've also throughout the course of our conversation discussed a lot of even contemporary debates. You mentioned you know, Florida and, and uh, reparations, uh, the state of the labor movement. What is the educational value for younger generations in the story of William B. Gould? Well, I think that, I think that um, the value of, uh, of William B. Gould is uh, the value that I myself obtained uh, from that, the story. I think that it's very important that our young people uh, uh, see that uh, uh, there are those who went before them in much more difficult circumstances than are confronted here today, uh, who uh, who were uh, up to uh, up to this challenge, up to this struggle, and uh, uh, just as uh, I said earlier, that I thought that uh, uh, he gave me uh, both as a young man and then as a middle-aged man in Washington in the 1990s. Uh, a sense of uh, a sense of strength uh, that uh, uh, nothing that I was confronted with uh, was remotely comparable to what he endured, uh, and I think that uh, uh, that's the the that's the principal uh, value of uh, William B. Gould's story for uh, uh, the uh, the young people who are coming up uh, today that uh, that uh, the answer is not to uh, uh, retreat into uh, mindless uh, passivity or uh, uh, criminality, but rather to uh, uh, try to uh, 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 focus on uh, what can improve uh, uh, both their lives and the lives of uh, their fellow uh, uh, those who are similarly situated. I think, I think that's the, the principal okay. lesson of William B. Gould. Excellent. And Professor Gould, if you could 
maybe zoom in even further for a moment and think about like the classroom. It could be, you know, one of your, you know, law classrooms here. It could be a K through 12 classroom. Pick out a couple like teachable moments from, and it could be William B. Gould. It could be how the story passes down. It could be your father. Pick, pick, pick some edu- uh, teachable moments for us that you could put in into a classroom in Florida like right now? Well, I think, I think um, uh, a classroom in Florida right now is, uh, uh, is uh, the fact that uh, here is this man who uh, is uh, literate, eloquent, skilled, uh, and unalterably opposed to uh, the system uh, that was uh, so fundamentally immoral and wrong. Uh, uh, I think that's that's something that, uh, uh, given the given the uh, propaganda that uh, is being put forward about this period of history, that there's no uh, that uh, a there were uh, literate people, there were uh, people who. Uh, as I say, who who write uh, 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 it, it's uh, who who write not only uh, uh, eloquently but uh, with penmanship that puts my Stanford students to shame. That uh, they're they're you know that they're uh, is uh, uh, that's something that's uh, uh, terribly important and uh, and w- which uh, has. Uh, Produces uh, uh, which do, which doesn't produce a sense of uh, 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 gratitude or uh, <laughs> or uh, anything like that, as the politicians down there are saying these days. But uh, but rather a sense of uh, the fundamental indignity of this uh, of this system. I think, and the other thing is that you know that they, he, he particularly in this period that here here are. Other people, all the other people that he is associated with, who are so talented and uh, so committed uh, to these uh, same principles during the period of uh, Reconstruction, the uh, uh, you know the 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 Mabsons, the Galloways, uh, uh, so many others that he uh, that he's in that he uh, is in touch with, that he corresponds with. Um, uh, that uh, you know, there's just no way of uh, of uh, saying that, that any 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 uh, more clearly than he said it. Right, Professor Gould. One, one more question. I'm looking at an effort that you have been involved in in trying to convince. The U.S. Navy to name a, a vessel in honor of William B. Gould, and I wonder if you could talk about why you embarked upon that and why you feel that's important for a vessel, a future commission ship here in the U.S. Navy to be named in honor of William B. Gould. Why? Why does that? Why is that important? Well, I think uh, I think two things. One is that, uh, and, and by the way, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is the fact that. Recently, a statue was created for William B. Gould in in Dedham uh, in May of this year. A statue was uh, established, and and uh, uh, we had a ceremony about that uh, on May on May 30 in in uh, or May 28 in Dedham. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, I it's uh, it's who shall be remembered? Who will be? Who will be? How, how will how will this story, and how will this man, and how will his values live on? Um, one way I think uh, is is this initially in 2021 a, a park was named for him, and then the statue uh, was uh, created for him in 2023. I think that the uh, uh, navy um, uh, is important because. Uh, uh, because it, uh, uh, so many who uh, uh, who support 
positions similar to uh, those that I support today are uh, anti-military, are, are suspicious of the military. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the great accomplishments uh, of the United States uh, uh, that was ratified in the Truman-MacArthur uh, era is the dominance, the dominance of a civilian uh, control of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the military. But, uh, you know, my, my father always said to me when I was thinking of becoming a lawyer, you wouldn't have this First Amendment, you wouldn't have this legal system if there hadn't been someone here to uh, protect you and to, uh, to fight off uh, those who were against it. And, of course, we, as a child, we saw, I saw this quite vividly in uh, World War II. Um, uh, so I, I, I think the idea that uh, uh, there isn't an inconsistency between uh, uh, a, strong, uh, a strong military controlled by the civilian government uh, and uh, these very principles, you know, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, uh, which is one of the, my father used to sing to us as a child when we were children, uh, he'd sing to us two things I always remember from the Civil War, the, uh, marching through Georgia, he would talk about how the Southerners would react to it, and the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and, and uh, this is the this is, this is how we, you know, one of my professors uh, always said to us, uh, uh, boys and girls, the uh, history of uh, this country is not primarily what's in this Constitution. The history of this country was made when Pickett's charge failed at Gettysburg. And uh, and I think that's something that uh, uh, that my that uh, this man William B. Gould and my father believed in very much, and uh, I, I I hope that the, the naming of a ship will carry that idea uh, forward uh, with it. Excellent. Well, Professor Gould, you know, there are, we could ask you questions all day, but <laughs> you have a life beyond. Uh, and um, I, I want to just really thank you so much. And um, also, um, if you could be tolerant of us, we may follow up with you at some point, maybe via Zoom, but if, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, with, with some follow-up questions. Because we will um, we'll process the interview, and um, we'll get you a copy of it, both video and a transcript, um, and also, um, obviously, to the National Park Service. And when they look at the interview, sometimes they may have some follow-up questions for us, and it could be connected to, um, I, I didn't really ask about the statues and, and or the statue and some other things, because I assume that they may already have some of that information. Yeah. But if it's okay with you, we may follow up in the future. Sure.